Bow in Wonderworld isn't the raging, burning street trash of a video game you've been told it is. But it isn't great either, and I really hate to have to say it. You may have seen my video floating around about how I was cautiously excited for this game, and let's say up front that the cautious part of that title was a good call. Now before we get too deep here, I do have to disclose that Square Enix sent me a free digital copy of this game for my PlayStation. Usually I'd follow that up with saying that getting a free game doesn't adjust my opinions on a game, but by the time you're done watching this video, I think it will be very clear that I've given my honest thoughts on the game. If you're unaware, Bow and Wonder World is a 3D platforming game developed by a team within Square Enix led by Yuji Naka, who programmed the original Sonic games and eventually became a producer within Sega before eventually winding up at Square Enix. It also has characters designed by Naoto Oshima, who designed Sonic and Eggman, and his development studio, Arzest, assisted development of this game. The pitch here was pretty simple. A couple of Sonic Teams' OGs reunited to make games like they used to make, seemingly aiming to bullseye nostalgia points from folks like me who really adore their old output. They named their team Balan Company, a pretty obvious nod to Sonic Team, and after putting out a demo that got raked over the coals online, we're here today in a post Balan world. You've probably seen the memes of this game, but today I want to dig into the actual content of the game and tell you about how badly I wanted to like it as a whole, but ultimately couldn't through the provided examples within. We'll start with some positives though, because while I didn't like it as a whole, that doesn't mean I didn't like aspects of it. I immediately have to give props to the composers for doing a pretty darn good job here. The score consistently has strong melodies and are appropriate for each of the game's worlds. It's no Sonic Team score, but it decently captures the intended spirit and does even better by its own merits, with a lot of focus on abstract vocals to help give it its own identity. It's a bit like world music, I guess? I'll be putting some of the tracks into my personal rotation for sure. I also quite like the game visually, uh, most of the time. Sometimes it misses and looks a bit too lo-fi for its own good, but there are times where this genuinely feels like a natural evolution of games like Knights, and it pleased me quite a lot during those times. That said, I can't speak for the Switch version before you've typed your comment. The CG scenes are also very whimsical when they do appear. Balan is still a bit too strange to me as a character design, but these do a lot to get his charm across. I'd say I enjoyed the first half of the game largely also. The last half began frustrating me more and more as I went along, but to talk about that, we'll need to start bringing my critiques, so let's just actually tackle this game head on. The story of Bow and Wonder World seems to largely be relegated to a $10 ebook that is separate from the game. I haven't read it, and this is a review of the game, so I'm not going to go into it other than to say things might make more sense if you choose to read it. You pick one of two characters, Leo Craig or Emma Cole, who both have some personal issue affecting them. Leo seems to be socially awkward, while Emma is shunned by the maids in the mansion she lives in. Well, I know which one I relate to more. Anyway, they both wind up in a theater while meandering around. Balan appears and tells them they each are missing a piece of their heart. A very Disney-feeling sequence ensues. And then you'll find yourself in the Isle of Tims, your central hub world. We'll touch more on this later, but after entering through a door, you'll be in your first level. And then the game unfolds for you. Quite literally, the game unfolds for you. Some props to the developers have to be given here. A lot of feedback was received from the demo about characters being too slow to control, and credit to them, they released a day one patch that ups the movement speed and makes the game feel better to play across the board. Running, turning, and jumping just feels more natural to control now, and I rarely had any issue with the core feel of playing as Leo, the kid I chose. Battle in Wonder World is structured as a world-by-world -world platforming game, where each world has two stages, called Acts, followed by a third act that contains a boss to fight. There are 12 worlds in the game, so there are 24 stages to complete and 13 bosses to fight, when including the final boss. There's a bit more than that, but that's spoiler talk, so we'll get to that later on. In each act, you'll run around optionally collecting these gems that serve a purpose in the Isle of Tims, and find keys that unlock these crystals that are specifically placed throughout an act and grant you an outfit when you crack them open. There are around 80 of these costumes in the game, and each one grants you one or two specific abilities when equipped. 
Generally, these abilities are related to movement or combat, serving one very specific purpose all the while. You can have three costumes at a time and switch between them freely, but taking a single hit makes the costume go away, leaving you to either move on without it or try to go back in a level and get it again from the crystal that gave it to you. Your goal in a level is to navigate to the end via platforming and light puzzle solving by way of the outfits within each level. Hidden in each level are a number of balanced statues, sometimes tucked away neatly in plain sight, sometimes requiring an outfit's ability to get to. You have to collect certain amounts of these throughout the game to keep progressing, so you'll want to keep an eye out as you play. So those are the basic fundamentals, but I want to now dive into how the game doesn't utilize them very well, to the point that it eventually frustrated me and eroded the goodwill it had built up with me. So there are 80 costumes in this game, with each world having 5 or 6 costumes specific to the acts within. Costumes don't get reused from world to world, but their abilities get repurposed between costumes. There's a pig outfit from the first world, and a robot outfit from the second half of the game that both jump, do a little hover, and can ground pound, with the same movement properties and animations. There are a considerable amount of costumes that do similar things, and sometimes even the outright exact same things, like in that example. In the water world, you get a jellyfish outfit that lets you swim through water passages and emit an electric shock when jumping to attack enemies. A few minutes later in the same level, you get a dolphin outfit that lets you jump during those water streams, but loses the electric jumps. Your regular attack can still defeat enemies, but it's now harder to do. This leads to two-thirds of your on-hand ability slots being taken up by very similar outfits. There's only a handful of instances where you'll be able to jump in those water streams, but they're necessary to finish the level. You also get a third, extremely situational outfit in this world that lets you teleport through walls. We'll come back to this one later on, but suffice it to say, it's used about three times in this world seemingly and can't jump it can only teleport dash forward a bit. After typing this, I just went and checked to see if that hurts enemies, and while it surprisingly does, it'd be awkward to aim against more mobile enemies. These costumes tend to be themed to the world they're in, the water level has aquatic outfits, and this firefighting world has things like a fire hydrant outfit and a ladder placing outfit, but there are times where outfits do literally the same thing as a different one, with the same movement properties and even animation, so it makes me wonder why this list just couldn't have been pared down some. At each checkpoint in a level, by holding down an action button and moving into these curtains, you can access a screen that lets you swap outfits with ones you've collected. You may notice the numbers next to each costume, which is when I'll now reveal a detail I omitted before. Costumes are perishable items in Bow and Wonder World, meaning when you get hit and lose a costume, it doesn't just get sent back to the screen, you actually lose it. This is annoying within a level, it means you have to backtrack and get it again, or do without, if the level design even lets you do without. But let's pull this out and take it to another step here and illustrate another issue that's emblematic of my frustration with this game. I've set some chess pieces here by mentioning some of these specific outfits and surprisingly managed to not mention this creepy chess piece outfit until now, so let's put them into play with this example I encountered. So in the sixth world, there's this huge gate along the back of this level's area. I noticed something shiny behind it and figured it'd be a tucked away balance statue. I was needing more of them to get to the final boss, but I couldn't quite figure out how to get past the gate. I eventually remembered the teleporting outfit from the water world, so I went to a checkpoint and swapped out for it. I also recognized the ladder placing platform that needs the ladder outfit from the 11th world, so I equipped that too. I used my teleporting outfit to phase through the gate and my ladder outfit to place a ladder, and again, I stress, using an outfit that is only found in the next to last world in the game, my only reward was an outfit called Mother Goose. The Mother Goose outfit lets you jump, do a little hover, and ground pound. It has the same animations as the pig outfit from the first world, there's nothing unique about it other than the cosmetic aspect of it. Why? Why does a level in the sixth world require an outfit from the second world and the penultimate world just to grant an ability exactly like one from the first. There's barely any point to having this mother goose when it's now the third outfit I've gotten that does what it does. Why is the sequence that wants me to have endgame costumes not giving me a balanced statue for my trouble here? 
To add on to the confusion, outside of this area in the same level are some spider webs that need the spider outfit from a different world. I remembered this tantalizing me in the demo, so now that I could finally use the spider suit, I climbed over here to see what there was to collect. The answer was nothing other than a few common gems. Again, why do I need a power-up from a different world just to come here and get nothing? This is also a great time to mention an annoyance with the enemies in Bound Wonder World that I have that will segue back into that costume talk I just had. Combat in this game is serviceable, more often than not. Each enemy takes a single hit, with many bosses taking three. These enemies are small, and unless you have a projectile-based outfit, require you to jump on them. Jumping in Bound Wonder World is often fine, but jumping and landing on very small enemies isn't always reliable. Sometimes I'd land right next to an enemy, get hit by them, and lose the outfit I needed. This happened to me frequently and only got more and more aggravating as I got deeper into the game. Sometimes a hit I'd swear should have registered didn't, and I'd just get slapped silly by these enemies. It made me genuinely dislike the costume system in this game. I don't understand why I can't just swap between costumes I had equipped at checkpoints and just had the traditional 3-hit health system like in, say, uh, a Super Mario. I'd pay $5 for DLC to let me do this. I'm serious. It would do so much to make me enjoy this game more. So much of my frustration stemmed from this issue because it can happen so frequently. When I had a really good combat ability equipped, like this cool jack-o'-lantern dude stretchy punch combo, I was usually set. But more often than not, I was rocking navigational abilities and not landing jumps. It's ironic because jumping onto enemies with a fast, slightly floatier control style is a problem that these guys actually solved in 1998 with the homing attack. It was a pretty neat idea. It's also an idea present here, perhaps unsurprisingly. Additionally, unsurprisingly, only one outfit in the game uses this homing attack. And I've also had instances where it, the homing attack connected didn't register as an attack, and I got hit and lost the costume, unsurprisingly. Also, I I'm not usually this guy, but enemies spawn in specific areas in this game, and they respawn often. So as you're running back to get another outfit or to try to find balance statues, you'll be fighting enemies often, which increases the odds of things like I just mentioned happening, and there's one battle theme in this game. I know the Werehog music in Sonic Unleashed is a meme, and rightfully so, but this put that to shame. To round out the Mother Goose example, there's a respawning battle section right before it in the level. The enemies there are easy to deal with, but if, in theory, I got hit and lost one of the two costumes I needed before I got to it, I'd have to go all the way back into one of the two levels they were in, grab the costume, exit back to the hub world, and then go back into that specific level to use the costume. I'm not against the idea of these costumes needing to be used outside the world they're from. If anything, it was kind of neat for a while to see parts of levels that I had just had no idea how to get to and mentally bank them to return to later, but having to anxiously go through each level hoping I don't lose the costume from a different level I need to get to those areas is not fun. Those examples are a bit of the more egregious ones, but suffice it to say these issues became more and more common in the back half of the game. The first six worlds are a mixed bag, but mostly lean toward enjoyable. There were times where I was sincerely enjoying the simplicity of the game and its notorious one-button control setup, losing myself a bit in the aesthetic of levels and wondering why on earth people were hating this game so harshly. But the back half of the game stumbles routinely with odd design choices like this world set in inside a struggling painter's mind. A pretty neat idea for a world, but the camera just doesn't like the tighter spaces it employs. It also has some narrow walkways with constantly respawning enemies. There were times where I fell from it while trying to dodge those enemies, fell and hit a saw blade on my way down because hey, this tight spot is placed right above a saw blade in this level. So if you find yourself struggling a bit here, like I did, the annoyances can swiftly pile up. And I want to make sure I'm clear here, these cherry-picked examples aren't the sole reason for my frustrations with Bow and Wonder World. They just perfectly represent a multitude of issues with the game. Bow and Wonder World rarely does any one thing so outrageously wrong as to sour the entire experience. Instead, it's a ton of very small things that build up and wear you down throughout the course of a playthrough. 
The platforming isn't really worth it either, with most of its levels relying on very basic, blocky platforming that doesn't feel rewarding or challenging to complete. Sometimes it just outright feels like it's designed by people who don't quite understand rewarding platforming. At its best, it is inoffensive with the occasional aha moment of finding something hidden, but it all feels routine and occasionally confounding with sections that don't quite feel made with the feel of the game in mind. Let's go back to the Isle of Tims. Tims are bird creatures akin to Nitopians from Knights or Chow from the Sonic Adventure games. I'm sure the book explains a bit more of what's up with them, but basically they're little dudes that hang out in this area. Five of them will follow you into levels, sometimes bringing you a key or an egg that will hatch into another Tim while they're there. The Tims mostly just want to eat constantly, all the time which are what the gems collected in the levels are for. Different color gems turn Tims into different colors, and after consuming enough, they grow big and can lay an egg when another Tim is thrown at them. The idea here is that they can spin a wheel and help build up this thing called the Tim Tower, and eventually restore the hub area. But it's not required for getting through the game, so honestly I have no idea what it's for yet. I haven't talked to anyone that has done it, and I just wanted to say it's here for those who miss Chow. I'm one of those people. I used to run one of the biggest Chow fan forums on the internet and helped run other big ones, but I just want to be clear and say that this doesn't seem to be nearly as involved as Chow. It reminds me a bit more of the Nightopian implementation in Night's Journey of Dreams, but hey, sometimes they'll wear a little hat and it's cute, so I guess that's good enough for me. By the way, I forgot to mention the Balan's Bout sections, the one time in the game where you do play as Balan. These are sections where Balan just flies through the air, doing things in cutscenes that look like they'd be kind of fun to play, but alas, any action within them are relegated to timed or mashed quick time events. You merely get to wait and press a button, or press a button rapidly to clear them. Another fun aspect of the way Balan Wonderworld is designed, you have to score excellent on each of these within a balance bout to get a balance statue. If you mess up, you can't pause and hit retry. You have to either abuse your system's app closure and start the game to go back to it, or exit the level and go back to the part of the level they're accessed from. Here's the cherry on top. There are 48 balance bouts in the game. 48! with a ton of reused quick time event sequences within. One stage had three of these in very quick succession, and the later ones in the game last a fair bit longer than the early ones, completely breaking the flow of that level. After beating the game, you'll actually unlock a third act for each of the game's worlds, adding an additional 12 levels and 72 or so balance statues to collect, but these aren't entirely unique acts, and instead act as reskins of prior levels with more challenging and costume specific elements within. It's nice that there's more content in the game than I thought, but honestly by the time I'd beaten the final boss, I just couldn't be bothered and I hate to say that. Bow in Wonder World really is a difficult game for me to talk about in depth because again, so many of the ways it stumbles are small. Elements such as the basic platforming are certainly more major, but more often than not, Balan is just a sobering game. Its target audience seems to be two demographics, people like me who adore old Sonic Team games, and kids. I'm not sure it succeeds with either audience. Judging by the reception online, it certainly isn't pleasing any old fogies like me, and I just feel like kids might find more frustration here than fun too. This is a game I really, really hoped would be better than it is. I want more games like it to exist, and the thought that this game's design and consequent reception might impede more from coming along certainly bums me out. There were even some design decisions I defended before the game fully came along, for example, due to the game assigning one action onto many buttons, some of the power-ups in this game can't jump because there's only one way to perform an action in this game. I, I thought that'd be okay in the end, but sections like this part in the firefighter world where my character couldn't even walk up a minor gap that really showed that, hey, the people who critiqued it were probably right. I really hoped this game would be great, and I tried my hardest to like it, but in the end, I just couldn't. Hopefully they get another shot and make a sequel that delivers, but I won't get my hopes up. Balan Wonderworld isn't the horrible game you've been told it is, but it should have been a lot better. If you've played the game, 
Let me know what you thought of it down below, because I'm really curious to hear from other people who have played the game. And with all that said, have a good one, and take care of yourself. Videos like this one are made possible thanks to my patrons, with special thanks to Adrian, Buckles Chucklow, Goldstorm07, Harry, Jeet, Joey, Patrick Thompson, Svendelica, The Crazy Even, The Legend of Groose, and Wolf Chaosan.